Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Alrighty, folks, it is Shay Warner here, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Casual Cattle Conversations. As always, I'm so excited to have you here. Now, to get started today, we are going to be talking about fencing leased pasture grounds. So Kyler is going to be sharing his story as a cattle producer and what leasing pasture grounds looks like for him. And Liam is going to be talking a little bit about how he's helped Kyler on the fencing side determine which products are going to be the best fit for what he's trying to do and really what he needs there. Because I think anyone who has rented pasture before is aware that, uh, Sometimes and most and oftentimes the fence situation can be a little less than ideal unless you have great and wonderful landlords. And if you do, kudos to you. But uh, I know a lot of people have challenges with uh, fencing lease pasture ground. So with that, let's get on with today's episode. It is actually a rerun from something I did um, early in the year, maybe last year, but it was just so valuable. Kyler and Liam do an outstanding job with that. Let's get to chatting. All right. Well, good morning. I guess not everyone listening is going to be listening in the morning, but it's morning for us. And uh, I would just want to take a time to thank you guys both for being on the show today. I'm pretty excited to talk about some reels and portable wire and talk about what both you individuals are doing in the beef industry. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So to start off, um, Let's have each of you explain and just talk briefly about what you do in the in- industry. Liam, let's start with you, and then we'll uh, have Kyler go after that. So my name is Liam Shaw. I uh, am the sales representative for Gallagher Electric Fence uh, in the Pacific Northwest, Washington, Northern Idaho, and Eastern Oregon. I've been with Gallagher for 12 years now, and just traveling around helping producers, farm stores, and with the electric fence needs. Um, him and I've known each other for quite a while and been a good buddy and a good customer. So I thought it was a perfect opportunity for producer to talk about some of the products that we use. Uh, I've got a small little hobby herd of cows myself. And so I dabble around in my own intensive grazing and rotational management. Well, absolutely. And rotational grazing and uh, management there has been a pretty hot topic on the show. The audience is really like that. So I'm excited to, uh, bring in yours and Kyler's perspective. So Kyler, would you share kind of your background and really what you're doing on your operation on the grazing side? So my name's Kyler Beard. I'm a rancher in Ellensburg, Washington. Um, A lot of my background, I didn't get into cattle till I was in my late twenties and started leasing property. And the area that we're in is really, um, has a lot of people moving in and being developed. So my opportunity has really come from getting places that are broke up or places that weren't grazed. Um, and with lease ground, it's hard to spend a lot of money. So that's where the temporary wire comes in, not only for um, intensive grazing, but also just to keep cattle in when there's no fences. So I started in the cattle, running my own cattle probably in about 2010. Um, and since then have kind of kept going and, and starting to put in a little bit more permanent fence, but a lot of what I have is all single strand hot wire that we're running out and started to to learn a little bit more about um, hot ground when we get into the the drier weather and the drought years like we've had the last couple of years. But um, yeah, Liam's Liam's been a huge help and we're college buddies. And then he went to work for Gallagher about the same time I started running cattle. So I've had a little bit of experience uh, deviating away from Gallagher, trying to save some money. And in the end, it really, uh, it, it didn't. <laughs> the products don't last as long and uh, keeping cattle in is the most important part. Well, absolutely. So, you know, I think what you, what you brought to light with about how in your area, you know, it's, it's being developed, people are moving in. So you have to kind of break up where you're able to run your cows. And that's something that isn't only being seen in your area of the country. I mean, that's happening all over. So I'm oh, kind of excited yeah. to really bring that in and talk about that a little more. So can you explain a little more about what your grazing strategies look like? I mean, you said you've used the temporary wire, but are you running 
um, on any specific protocols. I mean, most ranchers kind of adapt to their own systems as to what works for their timing and frequencies, but can you talk a little bit about the grazing strategy you are using in itself? Well, I've got two different types of ground that I'm running on. So in our valley, we have a lot of irrigation water. So everything on the valley floor is good irrigated grass. Um, and I've, I've done a couple different strategies and I'm still trying to find out what works with keeping cattle content and my schedule having to go from, I've got pastures that are about 40 minutes away from each other. Um, so when I, I started, it was kind of fast growth, fast move. So if, for instance, I had eight pastures on a 32 day cycle, there's seven pastures resting. So I would just divide the resting pastures by the, what I thought the grass cycle was. And when you do that, you, you end up having kind of an uneven graze, but as you slow the cattle down and stay there longer, you get a more even graze. And then I kind of went into looking at just residual height. Um, and naturally the pastures that are resting end up getting taller and more rank. So when you get into it, or not taller and rank necessarily, but there's more feed. So as the other pastures need more rest, you're slowing down to graze those off to a certain residual height. Um, and the irrigated ground is kind of fun to play with because it's it recovers really fast and you can you can mess up and still catch back up later. Um, the other ground that I have is dry range ground. So it's got some native forages. There's a lot of intermediate wheatgrass that's been planted on it. Um, and pretty much graze it off once a year. So when I'm grazing that, I'm purely looking at um, residual height and managing my impact. And then I'll switch what time of the year I go on those pastures. So most of the time it gets at least a year rest. Um, sometimes it'll get more than that. And the, the hot wire in that situation, you know, there's, it's in an area where there's a lot of wildlife and then there's also some predators and there's a lot of people. Um, and every land owner has different goals, but fire danger has been one thing everyone's really worried about. And I can't get to all the grass fast enough, especially when I'm starting on, you know, there's about a six mile distance from one side to the other. And I'm on one end and there's a landowner on the other that is worried about fire danger and wants their place grazed off. So last year I kind of put together this little track down the sides of the highway where I went up one side and down the other and grazed off a little 200 foot buffer along the edge of the road everywhere using the hot wire and we we're doing about one to two day pasture moves to get to the other side of the place so everybody would be happy with me um but that the dry range ground has probably been the most fun for me to to try to figure out how to improve it and and monitor and see the changes and the biggest difference i've seen is the amount of head days that i'm getting off at the days i can keep animals there but the plant diversity is really changing and so it's not necessarily that I'm growing more of the same plant, but you know, the soil starting to cover up with more plants and more diverse plants. So I've seen a lot more, especially the last couple of years, um, mules ear and balsam root have really started coming back. Those are both the yellow flowered plants um, and, and just seen, you know, some of the places have been farmed and the seed bank that's there and seeing all the different bromes and even alfalfa with no rain that pops up once cattle go across it. That's, that's really been, been pretty neat. But a, a lot of those places in that area I'm telling you about, there's no fences and there's no stock water. So a lot of room to expand and run cows on it with no infrastructure. Um, so for someone like me, I mean, for a few hundred bucks, I can go fence a section. That's probably a stretch, probably more like a thousand bucks, but <laughs> Fence the section with um, temporary wire, put a pile of cows on it and just be out of there, roll up my fence and go to the next spot without spending, you know, $20,000 trying to fence something. And that's the main thing is he's, a, he's able to bunch up his cattle pretty tight, make an impact on the ground, pick it up and move on and do it somewhere else, especially where he's at with the fire danger, we can concentrate grazing if we needed to get into some trees and buck, bunch up the cows there to hit the brush and get that understory taken care of, we're able to do it with reels and temporary fence. Well, that's awesome. Now, you really, you brought up a point earlier about how the past few years you've been learning with hot ground um, and fencing. Do you want to expand a little bit more on that if you haven't already, kind of what you mean there and if that's changed anything in your strategies? Yeah, it, and this is something Liam has been telling me since 2010. 
If there's a problem with your electric fence, it's one of two things. Almost always it's a short or it's a ground problem. One of the two. Yeah. So if your fence isn't testing high in KV, it's you're shorted out somewhere, regardless of what your fault finder is saying. And if it's hot and cattle are going through it, your ground field sucks. <laughs> so um, the last few years on the range ground, it has been so dry. Um, with single strand turbo wire, it's almost impossible to shock a baby calf. And so they don't have the same body mass in the water to start with that a cow does. So the cows will stay in and you've got calves running pretty much wherever they want. So when we get to the areas where you don't want calves out, um, run one ground at the bottom, run a two wire setup. And I make my bottom wire the ground because I don't want the, I want the cows to, to touch the hot wire on the top. And then also if there is a grass load on the fence, it doesn't short the fence out. So the bottom wire is a ground hooked right to the fencer and I still put in ground rods and have a ground field. And then the top wire is a hot wire hooked right to the, the fencer, obviously. So when the cattle stick, calves stick their head through it, they short themselves out essentially and, and go back to the fencer. And that really, um, it's really the only way to stop them and it doesn't stop all of them. I mean, we'll, we'll run groups of about 300 pair and you know you show up and there's 10 to 15 calves out even with the hot ground and i mean it'll just make you bite your lip and and kind of be upset and it seems like it's a lot but really i mean it's five percent of them that, that get out running that kind of a system so that's probably one of the, the biggest downfalls to what i'm doing with the single strand hot wires just getting next to highways and you know having little little baby calves running around up there but. well awesome liam do you have anything to add on to that yeah, hot ground system, it doesn't, it's not always applicable in every conditions, but where we're at, um, or in really snowy environments, a hot ground system on a permanent or a temporary fence is kind of necessary depending on your snow load, freeze and thaw, and you get that ice layer built up and that'll help insulate the animals. So sometimes you need that. And we can do it with permanent high tensile wire, or we do it a lot with temporary fence, especially weaning calves or just keeping calves in, especially along the highways. We got to have ground so that hot ground even on temporary fence is a good option especially being next to the freeway yeah no grounding is something that's uh been talked a lot talked a lot about on the show the past few months with your team so um thanks for adding to that yeah so you know you've really talked about how these portable systems have really been beneficial for you from an economic standpoint and especially in the areas that you are grazing so are there specific what specific tools within that are really making this easy for you you know which reels are there specific posts what types of wire do you want to talk about what tools or equipment are making this successful for you um, mainly everything that I, I started using is just the three eighths fiberglass post and they've got the little, I use the spring clips on them. And actually even this morning, I, our local feed store ran out of spring clips and I needed some new ones and called, called Liam to see if he could find some for me. And he said, well, can't you just go buy the other little cheap ones that you use? And I said, yeah, I could, I don't want to. So even, even just the, you know, the bigger spring clip, it's easier to get the wire in. You can pull it through if you've got a wire tight in your knot. Um, and I started out with uh, kind of my own homemade reel that I run run with a, a drill, which works pretty good, but I have to cut my wire quite a bit. And then it's really heavy when you get it loaded. It probably holds about five miles of wire. And so now I've been... We're talking about uh, turbo wire, poly Turbo product. wire, sorry. But yeah. And, and so now that I've been doing this a little bit longer, I'm starting to get more infrastructure and I'm building more high tensile fencing. And a lot of what I'm doing is just... Um, interior fences to make paddocks. And so now I'm starting to buy, buy more reels. And definitely the one that I like the, the most is probably the half mile reel. That's the three to one. It's a, a decent amount of wire when you're on it. So your arm doesn't kill you too much if you're walking, trying to roll it up. Um, but I've got a few maxi reels, which are nice just because they hold so much wire. And then I've got some of the little cheap black reels that I use more like a, a gate handle if I have to do an extra 30 feet off the other side of a line or something like that. But definitely that half mile three to one reels is my go-to now. Well, that's awesome. So the three to one reel half mile, and then uh, you said you like the spring clips on the post that you're using, right? The Gallagher spring clips specifically. 
Okay. They've got, a, they've got a larger loop on them than others on the market, and they hold that wire in. And like you said, it's a big enough loop that you can run wire through it, even if you had a knot in it, if you had to splice. So, okay. And then also, um, I think there's people that have had injuries. When you get that shorter hook, I've heard multiple stories of fences not being grounded, right? And cows rubbing on a post and getting a hook in their eye. So this hook is a lot better designed to not snag up on anything. Well, that's awesome. Do you have anything else you want to add about um, starting to implement reels into your operation or talking about those reels, Liam? Is there anything else you'd like to share? So geared reels is key, especially if you're going to be doing any kind of movement. Um, we do have non-geared reels and they're fine, especially if you're doing short runs. And like you said, if you're going to fence off a haystack or a weird waterway or something, you don't need to spend the money on a big geared reel. But if you're doing any kind of intensive management or you've got a long stretch of wire going out, the gear in the long term is going to save you. Um, three to one, you can put a pile of them on your side by side of your four wheeler. They got a cool locking mechanism on them. And where he's at, there's a bunch of elk and deer. So you can lock that reel on any perimeter fence with that same locking mechanism. Uh, the key to a geared reel is a good guide too. We we'll probably beat them up more than we need to, but when that wire's coming in as fast as it is, the uh, the guide on that keeps it all that wire concentrated on that hub. So okay. Yeah, there's a there's a bunch of cool things you wouldn't think about about a, a reel. Nobody really thinks about all the details, but our product design team has put a lot of energy into trying to make it as convenient for a producer as they can. Well, awesome. Yeah. Reels for fencing, not reels for social media, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Liam, you're in this area and you've obviously helped Kyler. Are there other like, you know, management strategies you see, or, you know, maybe let's shift this and what mistakes do you see people frequently making when they're implementing the reels and portable wires and those systems, like what are common mistakes you see producers make that you'd kind of like to see them avoid when they start out? When it comes to like the hobby stylist, people use the temporary fencing as their permanent fence. And I see it everywhere and it just makes me shake my head. Usually they haven't had a lot of experience in building fence. And so they just think it's hot wire and they put it up. It's a cross fence. Temporary fencing and reels are cross fencing. It's not your perimeter. Um, I think a lot of people make the mistake of tying, to, there's poly wire and everyone talks about poly wire, but then there's turbo wire or there's more conductive products on the market. You got to make sure that you're buying the right wire for what you're doing. If you went and bought four rolls of poly wire, I know you're going to go home and fail because even with the biggest energizer, that wire is not conductive enough. It can't handle more than a quarter mile. Everyone in the electric fence business sells a quarter mile poly wire, but nothing bigger for a reason. Conductivity just can't do it. So you got to step it up to the turbo wire to have that conductivity. And I mean, you run a couple, five miles at a time. Yeah. Because it can pass that energy down the line. Now you need a big power energizer to do it, but that's that is one of the biggest mistakes that I made in the beginning when I was saying I went away from Gallagher products. Um, turbo wire when I started, especially around here, was the best fence fencing wire that we could get, but it's really expensive comparatively when you're looking at it on the shelf. And the other, you know, even if it's a braided wire from somebody else, I mean, after one year in the sun, you go to pull your fence up tight and stretch it and it breaks. And pretty soon the whole thing is breaking. And I have turbo wire. I don't remember what I was saying. 2010 is when I started buying turbo wire. This is the first year I started throwing some away. And a lot of the reason I'm throwing it away is um, mainly just because there's so many knots in it. You know, I'll, I'll unroll it and I've cut it and spliced it so much with that big homemade reel that I have, which is why I like the little reels too. You don't have to cut your wire. Um, I mean, I'll roll it out and there's 20 knots within 10 feet. And I'm thinking, okay, I can, I can probably get rid of this wire now. Um, but the, one of the biggest mistakes that you can make when you're running turbo wire is your fence not being hot. If it's laying on the ground, I mean, the cattle are going to chew on it and then you'll have a dead spot in your wire that you don't know about and you can't figure out why the other side of your fence isn't hot. So if you are going to run a hot fence, you better make sure it's hot and don't leave your wire laying out, which I'm guilty of all the time. Sometimes <laughs> I don't know why, but there's something in that plastic that calves love to chew on. 
So yeah, you're usually cutting out 10 feet because it's all munched up and yeah, there's something in it they love. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, talking about some of those beginning mistakes or mistakes that you see other ranchers make on this front. Um, when we look at the fencing side of things, you know, you've really hit a lot of great areas um, as far as how you're managing and what other producers need to know. Is there anything else you would like to share with other ranchers out there who are um, interested in either improving or starting this process? You go first. All right. Um, yeah, I, I mean, just a little bit of difference. You know, if you you don't have to go invest enough to be doing one day pasture moves. But if if right now you're doing a two week pasture moves, buy enough fencing to make one more cross fence and do one week pasture moves. And it, it is amazing how much difference you'll see in, in how much grass you grow. It's more about the recovery of the grass ahead of you or behind you that you have to worry about more so than the pasture that you're in. Um, but the, yeah, I mean, that, that's all I would say. You don't have to get crazy about it. And that's one of those things when I was telling you kind of figuring out what works for me. I personally like three to four day pasture moves now. So I don't have to be right back there at three o'clock every day to be able to take the hot fence down or the cattle are going to be mad at me. And then I kind of like to place my mineral tubs and I like to ride horses. So I'll kind of place cattle within that pasture. If there's a spot, I need more animal impact. Um, but I've also done as much as, you know, moving them three times a day. And um, yeah, I guess just, just do what is going to actually fit in your schedule. But even, even doing, going from a two week pasture move to a one week pasture move will make a huge difference. And in this, crazy ag world that we're living in with the price of hay and fuel and just everything in life. Um, yeah, cross fencing and getting those head days. I mean, even just cross fencing once more, like he was saying, will save and you'll start seeing a difference in your ground, which is key. We need it for future generations. So every time you're cross fencing it or doing anything to that land that's gonna improve the quality of grass, that's less of your feeding. It's less of your having to go out there. Anytime you can cross fence, at least cut it in half. So yeah, I, I mean, I think that's great. And like I said, you know, the rotational grazing and regenerative practices, I've, I've been talking a lot more about that on the show. And that's something a lot of people have said in the grass recovery period. Kyler, I have another question since you kind of brought it up. So you said you like to ride horses. You know, how have you... in so what's the main way you've implemented still continuing to use your horses on your cattle while, you know, still having these fences? What does that look like? Well, if you want to train a set of cattle or border collies and you're moving cattle, if you do it correctly, I mean, cattle figure out they want to go to fresh grass. I mean, you see it all the time where everybody's calling them. You go to the gate, you get the cattle to look at you. I want the, I want the cattle to look at me and I want to be able to drive them and I want to be able to draw them to me. Um, so typically if I'm going to make a move with pairs, and this is the other part where your cattle need to be content when you're moving them. So if you show up and they're out of feed and they're mad, uh, you might as well just move them and let them get full and then worry about it later. But if you get it right, I'll go ride through everything. I'll get them up. I'll get the cows and the calves together. I'll let the calves start to suck and I'll leave the gate closed. And then I'll start to send them to the gate. And when they're all at the gate, I draw their heads to me, open the gate. They know they're going to fresh grass. And then I send them through the gate. Um, and so if you do that enough and you get your cattle trained to that, when you go into a set of corrals, it's no different than going to a fresh pasture. They understand how to move. Now, if you were you take the cues off you. Yeah. And so it's an opportunity to train them when you already know where they're going. And the same with a border collie dog. I mean, if you want to make some good border collies, all they want to do is go bring cattle to you. So if your cattle are already coming to you, it's pretty simple. <laughs> I mean, all you have to do is send them and all the cattle are coming and they show up and look like a bunch of rock stars. <laughs> um, so really the, you know, the frequent pasture moves done correctly. Um, I mean, you can get a set of cows really trained to handle and a set of dogs that are bringing cows to you. And the two of them aren't worried about each other. I mean, every time they see the dogs, they go, okay, where's Kyler at? We got fresh grass coming. Um, so it's, it's not a threatening thing to them or, you know, talking about the predators. That's one big thing 
I haven't had any problems with predators where I'm at and there has been some wolf predations and there's cougars and there's bears. And I mean, one of the pastures I have, it's a neighborhood now, but it is a thoroughfare for wildlife. Um, and that's why everybody's building up there because it's so beautiful. But I've had wolves pinged in, in my cow pastures and around them. And really, I, I've had hot wires get knocked down once in a while. But really, if it's up and hot, the elk don't bother it. Um, I mean, the biggest problem I'll have is they'll they'll hook the wire and drag it into an old down fence and then it'll short it out. Um, but having the cows bunched up like that in one big one big group with dogs that that the cows don't see as a threat. When they see dogs, they stand up, they get their calves and they get in a group um, rather than sticking their head in the air and running off. And that would, I would imagine, trigger a response in a wolf that would be like a cat running from a house dog. Um, so I think with the, the constant moving of the hot wire and the scenario changing and cows that understand to get into a group and stand up is really kind of, um, mitigating my risk with predators or at least giving me a little better chance than you know the guy that's kicking 400 out on 30,000 acres and hoping that he's going to be okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. I I really appreciate hearing that. So, and that's that's really interesting for me because we don't have the same amount of predators where I'm at. So, um that's really neat to hear actually. Um haven't had a lot of people from the west on the show. So, I like hearing the perspective there. Do you have anything else you want to add before we wrap up? In electric fencing in general, and Kyler alluded to it, you didn't buy enough power out of your energizer because you can never complain about more horsepower in your pickup. So same thing with your charger. Buy the most conductive fence for your situation and grounding. Those are the three key things on temporary and permanent fence to keep in mind. Well, awesome. Thank you very much for joining me on the show today. I look forward to sharing this uh, with my audience. Thank you for having us. And that's a wrap on that one. Be sure to let me know your thoughts on the episode. And if you have any further questions around the topic, take care and have a great day. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.